All right, guys, I'm Nicolette, and today Brian and I are here with Ehab Termoom. He is an applications engineer over at Microchip, and he's going to talk to us all about APEC and power and the future of the industry. So we've got a lot to talk about today, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. All right, so why don't we kick off by talking about APEC, right? APEC is the premier power electronics show in the U.S., and it's quite anticipated by the industry. And you were there. What did you think of the show this year? Oh, a great show, uh, record attendance. You know, the show just keeps growing year after year. Uh, you have a, a great mix of, of industry and, and academia. So you have this great collaboration and discussions from, from all ends of the technology spectrum. Um, for us, it was great. We were able to meet with customers. You know, for me, I met with a couple of customers I've been talking to over the last year or so, and I met them in person, which is really cool. Uh, our design partners and other partners we met with as well. Uh, we had a few sessions and presentations and interviews talking about our vision and our, and our solutions that we have. Um, the different sessions at APEC, the, the, the technical sessions were, were great, very engaging. Um, and they discussed topics that we're familiar with already and also some newer topics that, that, were, uh, that were also very interesting. So were there any themes that really stood out for you? Well, there's this overarching theme of decarbonization. Okay. You know, there's a global mandate to mm -hmm. uh, reach net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. And power electronics is going to be very inter instrumental in reaching that, in achieving that, that goal. Um, and from that, there are the different technologies, primarily wide band gap. So the big focus uh, at the conference was wide band gap. And with wide band gap, there's uh, two different, two main semiconductors we talk about today. Uh, the first one will be uh, gallium nitride, GAN, mm -hmm. and then the second one is silicon carbide, SIC. Mm -hmm. And um, so a, a lot of the sessions and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, people at the conference were discussing uh, GAN in terms of uh, data centers. So, you know, GAN's already established for low current, low voltage, but now they're looking at higher power for data centers because of all the cloud computing and the AI is so yeah. power hungry. Uh, so it's a very efficient solution for these 48 volt systems. And then you get into uh, silicon carbide, which is really exciting. Uh, that's where I'm focused at. at. And um, you know, we're already established at 700 volts and 1200 volts. It's really now beyond 1200 volts, what can we do? And so the first step is packaging for the, the discrete devices. There's a lot of new packages, including uh, you know, surface mount and top side cool. So you see all these innovative packages. And then also for the modules, uh, the, the idea is that uh, today the silicon carbide dye is already established, but it's inside of this packaging that's for silicon. Okay. So now we need to update everything surrounding that dye to really get the most out of it. So going to these uh, higher voltages, uh, more advanced packaging, higher integration, integrating gate drivers into these pa packages is really exciting. You can have uh, you know, fewer components in the end and, right. and higher reliability, higher power density. Um, and then... Uh, Another area that we'll see more and more over the years is uh, medium voltage. Uh, basically anything about 1500 volts up to tens of kilovolts uh, is this medium voltage range. So we're talking about being able to uh, tap into a, say a 13.8 kV, 13 kV uh, power line mm -hmm. and bypassing the big 60 Hertz transformer. So solid state right. transformers uh, also is another uh, area that's very interesting. So based on what you just explained, right? And AI has become a huge thing. And I've been reading all these papers on how data hungry, uh, how power hungry, you know, AI is, right? How do you see this playing with AI, with the evolution of AI and it growing so fast? Um, do you think the, the, how do you see the technology keeping up with that demand? So, um, in, in order to, to, to be able to, to support that technology, support that, that, mm -hmm. that, the power that's needed to, to right. support it, um, really need, need higher efficiency, higher power density devices and solutions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, servers is one area where you're seeing right. this higher efficiency, but then uh, how are we getting power to the servers? Right. And so mm -hmm. one area which we talk about today is uh, what we call an omnidirectional grid. It's not just relying on, on the, the power coming from uh, a power plant, but also mm -hmm. from other ener renewable energy sources, including uh, energy storage systems and being able to, to port power um, from from anywhere to anyone, anytime. That's what we refer to as an omnidirectional grid. Um, 
because the demand can be at, at random times uh, for EV charging, it can be late at night. So the idea would be to provide the, uh, the infrastructure, the grid infrastructure to, to support uh, the data centers and, and other areas that are, require high power. Do you, do you think some of them are going to actually start creating, I mean, and you see this already, but some of them are creating their own power sources, like creating their own solar farms that are going to be mixed in with the, the, you know, the power they're getting, you know, off, off the grid pretty much like there'll be, you know, because it's, it is, there's so much that needs, you'll see some additional, like, here's what we're, here's where we're going to go. We're going to generate our own power, you know, to supplement what we get yeah. off the grid. Yeah, so if you uh, look, look what's happening in Europe over the last 10, 15 years, they've already been investing mm -hmm. in in solar and wind power, and, and now they're focusing more on the energy storage side of things. Right. Here in the U.S., uh, there's several national labs that are uh, researching this, and there's areas in the northeast, uh, the co coast of the northeast, where they're looking to put uh, wind windmills, wind farms mm -hmm. there. And also west of the Rockies, more right. wind farms there. So uh, there's certain areas where you can ha uh, capture a lot of high power, but also locally, there's going to be a need to have more energy storage systems. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, residential charging stations yeah. uh, could include an energy storage system. So you have these smaller banks of energy mm -hmm. and also larger ones uh, th throughout. And then another area that also was talked about at APEC is uh, clean, clean energy. Uh, cl clean energy. So, for example, uh, green hydrogen, right. or there's a there's a, a really really interesting talk on fusion fusion power. Uh -huh. yep. uh, so, so generating power in not nuclear fission, but fusion, fusion and yeah. uh, using typically they would be using uh, large magnets or lasers. But in this case, we're talking about using power electronics okay. to uh, generate these high currents and magnetic fields in this plasma. Uh, to generate this clean energy. So that was a really uh, engaging and interesting uh, uh, talk. That's, that pretty, that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 it really is. All right, so Ehab, I want to go back to something we were talking about earlier about SIC and, and GAN. You know, Microchip is pretty well known for its microcontroller business, but Microchip also has a long history in power solutions like silicon carbide. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about that aspect. Yeah, um, there's a quick, quick story. You know, I... At APEC, you meet so many people there and also some old friends. So a friend of mine that works at a national lab came by uh, with his director and we're talking and his director says, oh, you do, you do silicon carbide? And uh, I told him, yeah, you know, we, we actually got that technology through the acquisition of MicroSemi back in 2018. And, and right away he goes, oh, yeah, uh, I, I, I remember I've used your parts. And uh, so that, that's kind of a hurdle that we have uh, that we're trying to overcome. Uh, people don't associate microchip with power in silicon carbide, but when we mentioned microsemi, they, they understand that. Uh, now, microsemi had acquired a company called APT, Advanced Power Technologies, back in 2006, and uh, they were a well-known established power semiconductor company. And through these acquisitions, we actually have been in the silicon carbide business for over 20 years and delivered our first uh, SICK device in uh, December of 2003. So a little over 20 years. Of, uh, of silicon carbide uh, you know, uh, background and experience. And we have also uh, still today, uh, members from that team are, are with us leading our designs, our technical fellows, including our, the ones who develop our dye and our power modules out of Bordeaux, France. So we still have a lot of uh, you know capability with decades of experience in silicon carbide. Right. Well, And then um, also if I can mention, uh, we do have a very broad portfolio in our silicon carbide uh, uh, technologies that we have. We have what we call it, we call it MSIC is the uh, the brand that we refer to as MSIC MOSFET MSIC technology. And so we have uh, die, discrete, and power modules, and we design and manufacture all of these. Uh, and we also have gate drivers. Now, when it comes to the power modules, th there's a a lot of challenges in designing a power module. It's hard enough with silicon, regular silicon, but when you get silicon carbide, it's even more difficult because it switches so quickly. You get this really uh, you know, high efficiency using silicon carbide, but it switches so fast that it, it will excite all the parasitics in the circuit, causing all this overshoot and ringing. So uh, you really have to know how to design it properly. And our power modules are designed so that mm -hmm. the uh, inductance on that gate drive circuit on the power loop is very low, uh, so you can achieve that that highest uh, efficiency and highest power density. So we have that know-how uh, to design these uh, power modules with several devices uh, you know, connected in parallel. 
So and is is there something? Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to ask. You know, you mentioned the challenges designing power modules with with SIC, but how how does that compare to designing power modules with just silicon or you know any other material? Yeah. So uh, even with silicon, you know, there's a lot of challenges with it. Uh, but when you go with silicon carbide, it, it just switches so much faster. Uh, where so for example, with silicon. Uh, you might switch at five or 10 volts per nanosecond. Silicon carbide can switch to 100 volts per nanosecond or even faster. And it's just going to be exciting circuitry. And what might have been maybe a, a 10 volt overshoot with silicon would be a 100 volt overshoot with silicon carbide. And now you risk overstressing the device and, and damaging it. So you have to be more careful. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to it, but it's also a lot riskier. And that's where our gate drivers come in. Uh, we acquired a company called Agile Switch in 2019, and they developed a technology called augmented switching. And what that does is when you drive the MOSFET on, you, you drive the voltage from negative 5 volts up to 20 volts. Uh, with augmented switching, what we do is we introduce these st intermediate steps. So going from minus 5 volts, we go to another voltage, which is programmable, and the duration is programmable. And then you go to your final voltage. And same thing at turnoff. You have these intermediate steps that are configurable. And that helps you really um, with the switching performance. So the DVDT and the DIDT uh, will be, uh, the overshoot will be minimized, less ringing, and you can have better EMI performance. Uh, so instead of changing a bunch of gate resistors one after another, uh, you can just program in uh, different timing, different voltages, and let you have a better control of, it, of that switching. Okay. Because uh, yeah, there's just the the effects of that fast switching can uh, you know can cause a lot of damage if it's not done properly. So I was going to ask what um, engineers sort of need to know about what we just talked about, but you guys had a lot of demos at APEC. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, um, Microchip we're a leading provider of smart, connected, and secure embedded control solutions. So what we do in our designs is we include uh, all the different technologies that we have available uh, to provide a complete solution to a customer. And, and so we have you know analog, digital control, uh, and uh, uh, connectivity and power, and we include these in our design. So uh, one of them that we presented at, at APEC uh, was a, a thirty kilowatt PSU. It's a power supply unit, and it's used for DC fast charging stations. So it takes the AC power, the three-phase AC, and outputs DC to charge a 400-volt battery. And uh, the idea would be that you would stack these 30-kilowatt modules to, to reach whatever power level you're interested in, whether it's 150 kilowatts, 360, or whatever. And um, that uses our silicon carbide uh, MSIC technology in order to achieve a very high efficiency. So we had... Uh, plenty of customers come come by, our visitors come by at our booth, and we're, we're just in awe of this uh, uh, power supply unit. So really uh, got a, a lot of interest. And then we, we had a few other demos I'd like to talk about. We had a um, integrated power module. And this is for uh, aircraft uh, applications where you have actuation systems that will control the flaps of, of a wing. And uh, with these, these, they're integrated so they can they have... The, uh, you know, the idea is that you switch from the hydraulic systems to the electrical systems. You have higher reliability, fewer mechanical parts. And so these electrical systems would rely on these integrated power modules that, that we develop. And they have um, different uh, configurations within it to drive the, the three-phase motor, the solenoid, and other, other features in there, all within one unit. And then on top of that, we include the gate drive. So the gate driver circuitry. And it's not just the gate driver itself, but also the gate drive power supply. So you know when you're driving a SIC MOSFET, there's a positive voltage and a negative voltage. So each FET is going to have two, two voltage rails associated with it. Typically, gate driver cars are going to have uh, multiple supply inputs to power all those rails. But in our case, what we do is we have just a single 15-volt input and we generate all the supplies for all the different FETs in there. So it gives, again, the customer a solution that they can just, it's ready to use. And it, it, and it works for uh, both, with both our, our silicon IGBTs and our silicon carbide MOSFETs. Uh, and it's a very, you know, high efficient solution. And it's rated for the DO160 uh, aerospace applications. Another a, a design that also I thought was very interesting, because I don't, I personally don't work in this area, is our space grade 
DC DC converter. So now we're talking about uh, DC DC converters that you would put into a satellite or into a space station, mm -hmm. and they're rated for uh, low Earth orbit, medium Earth or orbit, and also deep space. So you have to be able to withstand all the uh, you know, the, the the neutrons and, and ion, ion, ions in uh, in space, all the particles. So it's rated. It has you know red hard. Uh, device so it uses red hard components and red hard uh, uh, circuitry to be able to work in deep space so that's very interesting and it comes in 28 volts all the way up to 120 volts like for a space station um, another demo that we had was the e-fuse uh, you know with all high voltage in these different applications circuit protection is so critical and so we have a, a high voltage silicon carbide based e-fuse technology demonstrator uh, that, that we using our, our, our MSIC MOSFETs. And, and so that also is very interesting. And it's a, that's a hot topic uh, uh, in, in the industry, especially in automotive, uh, but also in industrial with solid state circuit breakers. So a, a lot of uh, inter interesting demos. And we had several other demos too that, that uh, at the show. And then we also uh, introduced some new products. So one of the, the newer ones, which is very exciting, is our 3.3 kV XIFM plug and play MSIC gate driver. And what this is used for is uh, for these higher voltage applications, you know, there's rail applications. There's a consortium called Rural to Rail, where um, several module manufacturers have developed this common footprint for a high voltage power module where uh, it has 10.2 uh, kV reinforced isolation. So you're talking about very high voltages. And what we have with this uh, gate driver technology is a um, plug and play board that mounts onto these industry standard modules and it's ready to go. So it consists of the gate driver power, the, the control circuitry and the gate drive um, circuit itself, the driver all in one assembly. And it's designed, it's tested and it's qualified to the rail standard uh, EN 50155, if you're interested. Um, and that way customers can just take that that product, this gate driver board, and uh, mount it right onto their uh, power module and it's ready to go. Now, one of the interesting things with rail applications is the controller that generates all the PWM signals uh, is, is remote. It can be several meters away, up to 10 meters away. So the control lines are not going to be electrical wires. Instead, it's fiber optic, and that's what this has. It has fiber optic uh, inputs and actually bi-directional communication as well uh, for uh, communication with that controller. So it's a nice solution where it's, it's qualified, it's ready to go, uh, and even uh, several of the manufacturers of those modules I was talking about are, are very interested in it because it gives them now a, a solution that they can give it to their customers. Uh, so so that, that was also very interesting. We had uh, demos with our SIC power modules. We, we do have different uh, module packages and newer ones that are baseless. So typically a module has a base plate in it, but we have a version, a family of, of modules that do not have a base plate. They're called baseless modules, but they're designed for aerospace. And so they're very rugged, which is unusual for baseless module. They're very rugged and designed to that DO160 standard, environmental standard, so it's robust to uh, you know, vibration and mechanical shock and all the temperature cycling that's involved there. Um, and it uses uh, very high thermal performing uh, material in order to, to achieve those, that performance. Uh, and then finally, we actually announced that week of APEC, our, our new digital signal controller. It's a DSPIC based DSC integrated motor driver. So the idea is um, instead of having a separate control box with the inverter to drive a motor, is why not integrate that controller in that motor assembly instead of having two separate units? And so what we did is we developed a, a, an IC that integrates the controller, a, an LDO voltage regulator, a communication interface chip. We have two options, either CAN or CAN FD or uh, LIN and also six gate drivers. So now you can drive a three-phase motor uh, and it's all in this one chip. So now uh, actually at APEC, we had a demo for an automotive cooling fan where all that circuitry was on one small board mounted on the back of the heat sink of that, of that cooling fan. So it's used uh, in applications where you have fans, pumps, uh, compressor motors. So it's a nice 
a solution that gives you much fewer components. And again, fewer components generally result in higher reliability, higher power density, and just better solution overall. So you mentioned this eFuse, and with all the sort of new technologies we've been talking about, how do the two sort of work together? Yeah, so uh, eFuse, uh, for the last few years, it's been a really interesting topic. You know, for a long time, it was mostly academic, but now it's actually being designed into circuits. Um, and actually, I gave a talk at APEC on, uh, on eFuse. We had actually two talks from, from Microchip uh, on eFuse. One of them is called eFuse It or Lose It. And the idea is uh, today you have circuit breakers, fuses, uh, contactors for interrupting currents if there's an overcurrent in, in disconnecting circuits. Um, but they're slow. And even a pyrofuse, which is a very safe, reliable device, uh, is slow. It still takes just under a millisecond. And when you talk about a high voltage system, 400 volts, 800 volts, 1500 volts or higher, um, if there's a short circuit, that current's gonna shoot up to tens of thousands of amps instantly, like within microseconds. And so with an e-fuse based on silicon carbide, we're able to react very quickly. And it's all controlled. We're not relying on the material physics of a, a, a device to, to warm up. No, it's measuring current. And so now you can have it very accurate. And if you see a, an overcurrent, you can quickly respond and, 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 and dis disconnect the circuit. And that limits the amount of let through current and let through energy that goes downstream. It maintains the bus voltage so other loads on the bus can continue working. Um, it also has the integrated current sensing in it. So you, you don't need to have a separate current sensor. You can integrate that functionality. It's a switch, so now you don't need to separate a, a fuse and a relay and a contact, or you can have it all in one device. Um, there's no moving parts, so you don't have to worry about arcing and arc flash. So safety-wise, it's a great solution. Um, it's electronic, so it doesn't. It's not a one-time trip device, so you can uh, reset it. You know, imagine, uh, and, we, and we've seen this in cars where we had a lot more fuses in the past, and they've gone to smart drivers and. And so now you don't have to worry about replacing so many different devices, uh, f uh, fuses, but it lets you package it anywhere in the vehicle. You don't need to access it in order uh, to service it. You don't need to service it. So it eliminates all those design for serviceability constraints. Uh, and there's a lot of other benefits of it. Uh, it's a great, great solution. And um, it, 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 it just it has so, so many benefits and uh, allows for much safer I, I mean, w w when you have a, a device uh, trip, it's an event that occurs. You hear a popping sound, things can blow up. With an e-fuse, because it doesn't deliver much current, because it, it will trip so early, it, it trips. It's not, it's not a, an exciting event, which you don't want, you know? So uh, right. it's, it's <laughs> right. great technology. Yeah. And, and one other area we're seeing it now, a lot of interest, is an EV toll. So electric uh, vehicle, uh, a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, uh, planes, aircrafts. So where the weight matters, so now you, you may not necessarily need to have all this heavy copper uh, in order to conduct these short circuit currents. Instead, you can size your copper for your load and you can rely on the e-fuse to uh, trip at the current where it should trip at instead of allowing thousands of amps to, to conduct. So that can result in much lighter uh, systems, which is critical for, for an aircraft. So, yep, I would I want to take a look at the trends now in silicon carbide adoption yeah. and maybe even take a high level look at the industry as a whole when it comes to semiconductors and white band gap. You know, where do we see this evolving over the next, let's say, three years? Yeah. So uh, when, when you look at uh, silicon carbide, the, it's already established. And so the I think what we're going to see are more and more uh, innovation in terms of packaging. Uh, more integration, maybe adding features like gate drivers and and um, other types of uh, innovative packaging. And same thing with, with GAN as well, with the gallium nitride. Uh, we, we are seeing that now, and I think it'll continue to evolve where they're integrating the, the gate drivers and protection all into one device. Um, GAN is also looking to go to higher voltages. So there's this voltage range where you have silicon, GAN and silicon carbide all competing. And I think they each have their, their own place, right? With GAN, you have uh, you know, a few kilowatts worth of power capability. Silicon carbide, you have very high efficiency and high power capability. Um, but 
you don't necessarily need that in all applications. So there's still a place for silicon carb, uh, silicon uh, IGBTs, uh, especially where it's more like in maybe industrial static type systems where it does, it's not variable uh, speeds. Uh, so you can have it just, you can optimize it at one operating point. So I, I think uh, integration and packaging is going to be the, the big area that we'll see uh, trends in, in, in the sand, in GAN and uh, silicon carbide. Um, and then the other thing is with the different applications. You know, we've been focusing on electric vehicles. Within the EV, there's the traction inverter. And then you have some other power electronics like the OBC and DC-DC. Now, the die requirements for a traction inverter is typically different than what you would have for an OBC. It has a different function. It's not switching as fast in, an, in a traction inverter. So I think we're going to start to see some application-specific die uh, for silicon carbide to support these different applications, whether it's for traction inverters, for OBCs, or even uh, the E-fuse and solid state circuit breakers. Uh, you know, those aren't switching on and off at 100 kilohertz. They're just turning on and then turning off, and that's it. Uh, but they have other requirements, maybe in terms of short circuit capability, low conduction losses. So I think we're going to start to see some more, like I said, application-specific die uh, for these different applications. Um, and then the, uh, the very exciting area is in medium voltage, starting to see higher and higher voltages. So today we have 3.3 kV devices. Um, in my opinion, with silicon carbide, uh, it's, you know, it's great at 700 volts and 1200 volts. I mean, that's the solution at 1200 volts today. Um, but it's a lot more exciting and you get a lot more out of it. You can really leverage the benefits of it at these higher and higher voltages. So if we're talking about uh, 10 kV, we could, we could have silicon carbide MOSFETs at 10 kV. If you go higher than that, you could have silicon carbide IGBTs. And so now you think about those, um, the um, you know 60 hertz tra transformers, you can bypass those altogether. You could have a DC fast charging station that would, instead of connecting to 480, it goes to that 13 kV uh, and it would integrate a solid state transformer. You can imagine like the substations in your neighborhood uh, with all these mechanical and magnetic bulky parts and switch gear all switching over to power electronics. So be much higher efficiency, much faster and much smarter. You know, with the grid, it's so critical that it's reliable and resilient. And part of that resilience is intelligence and being able to have electronics in it and respond quickly and diagnose and check for state of health and and uh, other uh, uh, diagnostics is, is critical. So I think we're going to see um, that type of progression uh, in different industries, not just in the, the grid, but also in other applications, whether it's more electric aircraft, ships, uh, submersible vehicles, um, trains, and, and so on. So we're going to see a, a lot of, uh, a lot more power devices in, in areas that we haven't seen them before. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you for talking with us about the demos and everything that you guys were showing off at APEC. Um, you know, could you just let us know where we can learn more about everything we just talked about? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's really easy. It doesn't get any easier than this. It's microchip.com slash sick. There you go. And there you, you <laughs> find all our uh, product portfolio, our design resources, including some online uh, uh, the circuit simulation tools. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so thank much you for so joining much us for today. Us. All right. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay.